So afternoon for your time, Matt. Um, it's Jason Archer here from, from Abacus Bio. Um, I'm with Matthew Cleveland from, from ABS, and um, we're going to have a chat about a couple of things that ABS are doing. So how are things over there, Matt? It looks looks like a nice view outside the back of you, over your shoulder there. It is. I've got a nice summer storm coming across a hayfield right behind me, so it's, uh, it's great to be here, Jason. Thank you. Yeah, and you're in uh, Wisconsin? I am. I'm just outside Madison, Wisconsin, uh, at our at our uh, global bull, our bull stud here uh, uh, for ABS. Yeah. Okay. So maybe uh, we could just start by uh, who, who's ABS? Who are you? What do you do? Sure. Okay. Uh, I think ABS is a, is a fairly well known fairly well known company. Uh, ABS has uh, 75 years of history uh, in the animal genetic improvement space. Uh, and so essentially we, uh, we sell genetics uh, for beef, both beef and dairy cattle around the world. Uh, we operate uh, in about 70 different countries. Yeah. And you've got a pig side to your business as well or part of your parent company? We do, yep. So ABS is, uh, is part of a publicly traded company based in the UK called Genus. Uh, and so ABS, has, ABS uh, has been a part of Genus since 1999, uh, and then in 2005, Genus also acquired PIC, uh, which is the, the world's largest uh, pig breeding company, and so PIC is, is now our sister company here at ABS. Yeah, good. And um, so today I was just interested to, to talk to you about some of the things that ABS has, has got going and um, in the genetic space, and, and I know there's, there's a few novel things happening, and and I see on your website um, you've got a brand called New Era. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what, what New Era represents? We, we launched uh, our New Era Genetics brand uh, just about a year ago, uh, which uh, we launched it last July. So the tagline for New Era is efficiency, profitability, and sustainability. And really what New Era is, is it's, it's, a, it's a program, it's a brand uh, that encompasses all of our efforts to deliver more value to our customers and really more value to, to the entire supply chain. So really our, our clear mission for this program is to develop differentiated genetics that maximize whole, whole chain profitability and really allow us to be responsive to, to the, our changing customer needs globally. Yeah. And as part of that new era of brand, um Sounds very much like you're developing your own genetics. So I guess what I know of ABS or have known of ABS in the past is um, your business model was to to go and buy um, very good bulls, elite genetics that are being bred by whoever it might be around around the world, um, and then to take those bulls into into your stations and to basically collect semen and just distribute semen around the world from those bulls. But it sounds to me like like there's a little bit of a change to that business model or how does that? How does it all fit together? Yeah, absolutely. I think you. I think you've described our, our business model very well, uh, and I think you know that that's a strong model for us. And we certainly we certainly continue to have that model. You know, we work very closely with our breeders in, in different parts of the world, and you know, our breeders are, are certainly producing elite genetics that that have value for our customers. I think you know over the last number of years, what we have felt is really there there are some. There are some markets and segments that around around the world that we think have been underserved um, uh, by genetic improvement uh, by b- b- genetic improvement of beef cattle, and so we've really we've looked at how do we you know how do we how do we serve those markets, and one of the ways that that we've done that is to start to produce some of our own genetics for specific market markets and segments, and so really. That, that's an effort to create something that's differentiated but also tailored to those specific markets while providing robust genetic improvement, predictable performance, and then ultimately more value for, for you know everybody across the supply chain. Yeah, and and so where do these programs fit in? What what are these targeted markets um, that you think that that uh, that you're targeting your, your product at? Yeah, so today um, we actually have uh, two different lines that, that we've built, two different lines internally of, uh, uh, of pr- proprietary genetics. And so uh, really we're looking at a couple of very specific markets and segments. Uh, one of those markets uh, would be beef on, the beef on dairy uh, program in the U.S. or the beef on dairy market in the U.S. We see a lot of opportunity to deliver improved beef genetics to the dairy herd. Um, we're also looking at the really 
commercial focused, really terminally focused market in the U.S. You know, so how do you how do you drive additional value across the supply chain and how do you recognize genetic improvement across that supply chain? We're also focused in the U.K. on beef on dairy. Uh, beef on dairy is a very strong market in the UK, and we, you know, we've been in the beef on dairy segment for a long time. But we see there's a lot of opportunities to develop uh, even more improvement, uh, both for the dairy farmer as well as for the supply chain. And then finally, another area of focus, and these are just three examples, but another area of focus would be in, in Brazil, uh, where we're focused on the, the kind of the tropical crossbreeding market. So the, you know, the, the European genetics on a malaria cow creates a calf that has significantly more value to, to the market, particularly as the, um, the focus in Brazil turns to producing a higher quality product. Yeah. And so your new products that you're coming out with... Um... Are these particular breed lines, or 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 how where, where are those products coming from? Yeah, so really, um, if we focus on on the line that we've created, uh, focus mainly on the U.S. and Brazil, although also a little bit in the U.K., we're really building composite lines, and so we're we're essentially trying to take trying to take the best from 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 multiple breeds and create a composite that we believe really addresses the needs of of those specific markets, and we believe you know creates the right the the right composition of genetic the right genetic package, if you will, to go into those specific markets. Okay, great. And so, um, what sort of trait emphasis are you are you looking at? So, you, I guess that these are terminals that you said because it's beef on dairy and it's and it's composite over tropical. Um, yeah. What, what are you looking for out of out of out of your trait mix in, in these composites? Yeah, exactly. So we've really focused on the terminal market. Uh, you know, we feel that. Um, I think as an industry, we're, we're doing it. We're doing a fairly, fairly good job of, of addressing the maternal side of the equation. We feel we have really strong genetics that we can work with our breeders to bring it on the maternal side. And so really we focus on creating, creating terminal lines of cattle. And so we're really looking at traits that are going to impact profitability in that, in that terminal space. So in that supply chain. So we kind of think of it in terms of three different categories. So we look at growth, we look at efficiency, or you can even combine those, look at the efficiency of growth, as well as carcass characteristics. And, and those traits are going to uh, be defined probably a little bit differently, depending on the market you're talking about. So the U.S. will define, you know, carcass quality different than the U.K. or Brazil. But ultimately, you know, we're designing the right genetics to go to those specific systems for those types of traits. Yeah, sure. And so composite breeding um, is a fascinating approach to, to things. It's, it's a little bit different from traditional breeding, I guess. Uh, there's been composites in the past, and I guess you know one of the famous ones that I can think of is um, Santa Gertrudis, which are, which, are, which are great cattle, um, produced in the or bred in the US originally, uh, but have made their way around the world. And so there's a successful composite. But Santa Gertrudis uh, closed the herd book at, at some point, uh, is that what you're intending to do, or, or or are you going to keep on feeding in new genetics, new breeds into this? Component? Yeah, I think. I mean, I think from our point of view, there's a bit of a danger in thinking we have it all figured out. Uh, particularly this early into a breeding program, we're only about four years into this this new endeavor, um, and so there's there's a danger in us stepping back and saying, well, you know, we've got we've got everything, and now we can just kind of close it up and go on our way. And so I really think, well, you know, we see a lot of value in genetics that are out in the industry today uh, for all these traits that we're looking at. So we're going to to continue to sample those genetics into our program as we move forward. Good. Yeah. And those genetics will mainly come from the U.S. or from wherever you can find them? Yeah, I think, I think honestly, we're looking for the best genetics and we're looking for the best genetics to, to serve our customers. And so, you know, today I would say you know, the, the founding population for, for some of what we're doing, you know, that, that would have come from the U.S., but we're certainly open to bringing those genetics from kind of wherever wherever they reside. Yeah, sure. And and so your model, um, you're an AI company, your model is still around AI, is it? Or, or is there any, um, you know, is, is there any delivery via, via bulls on the hoof? Yeah, I mean, we absolutely recognize that to provide a c- complete solution to most of our customers. Now, I'm going to exclude the dairy customers from that because obviously that's going to be strictly da- strictly AI in most cases. You know, we recognize that to deliver a complete solution, there's there's almost always a bull involved. And so, you know, we have done some things uh, on the live animal side, on the, on the natural service bull side or stock bull side um, in the past. But ultimately at our core, we're, you know, we're an AI company, we're a genetics company that, that delivers improvement through AI. And so that's really where we're going to focus our efforts. 
Yeah, and obviously to, to deliver via, via AI, you, you need a reasonable value proposition um, compared to the alternative. So you think you've, you've got that, obviously? AI well, I mean, that's, obviously, that, that's always going to be a challenge, right? If we look at you know AI use uh, across the, the, the beef population in the U.S., is, depending on who you ask, it's probably somewhere between 5 and 7%. Uh, it's a little better in Brazil where it's, it's more like 12 to, to 15%. And I, and I honestly think that's, that's probably a good illustration of, of where things can go. You know, what drove the use of AI, or the increased use of AI in Brazil, was really um, a different value proposition. It was, you know, it was genetic improvement that you couldn't get any other way than, than using AI. And so they, you know, over the last 10 or 15 years, they dramatically increased their use of AI because the value was there. And so that's really, that's our challenge is we have to, you know, as you say, we have to create enough additional value, incremental value for our customer that we're going to be, we're, that we're going to be able to see that, that use of AI increase over time. And so that's, that's, that's going to, that's, I mean, that's anybody's challenge in, for genetic improvement. And, and, you know, that'll be our, that'll be our challenge as well. Yeah, sure, sure. And so, so one of the one of the challenges, I guess, that composite breeding programs have faced around the world is is um, getting genetic evaluations going. Um, who do you compare yourself to? How does it run? All that sort of thing. Um, what are you doing in the space about genetic evaluations for for your composite breeding program? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, the the thing is, we can. We can make genetic improvement, and we can tell people we've made genetic improvement. But until until people actually see that we can deliver deliver additional value to them, then then my words are meaningless essentially. And so you know we've built up the infrastructure internally to do genetic and genomic evaluation. So that's really that's the first part of it is we have to understand you know what genetic value are we actually creating. But I think probably as important or even more importantly is that is that really that validation piece. So once we've made our genetic improvement and once we're comfortable that we're actually going in the right direction, we have to put those genetics out into the market and we have to test commercial animals and understand are our genetics performing as we think they should perform. And so really it's that validation piece that, we, that we've put a lot of resources and effort into over the last couple of years, making sure we can get that commercial data back. So one, we can feed that into our genetic evaluation and make better selection decisions, but also two, so that we can have, so we can, we have validation and we have, uh, you know, we have a we have something we can demonstrate to our customers. You know, here's here's the genetic value that we can deliver uh, to you, and and here's the commercial data that 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 shows that. Yeah. So from you've got a, a composite population, and you're you're evaluating that, you're calculating EBVs for that population. How do you go about comparing to what outside genetics you might want to bring in? Um, there might be a a bull of another breed, who knows what breed, but how are you going to sort of um, evaluate as to whether he's going to add value to your, to your program or, or not? Yeah, so, um, yeah, so I think there's, there's a couple of different things there because, you know, ultimately, um, you know, and what we know by working, working in different markets and di different environments is, you know, really the, the gold standard is I've got to collect the data in the environment. Um, in which I want, in which I want to place my genetics, right? And so we we put a lot of effort in, into doing those sorts of things um, to look at outside genetics. You know, ultimately we have to evaluate those animals on um, on, a, on a scale that that is comparable to what we're doing. And so you know, we do some things to to bring in outside information and. and put in our genetic evaluation, but ultimately, yeah, it's about, we've just got to get those, those bulls on the same scale so we can make a fair comparison. Yeah. So bring them in, give them a go and, and evaluate them yourself. Exactly. Under your system. Exactly. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, one of the features of, or, or I guess one of the benefits that's often sold around composites is, uh, is hybrid vigor, but there's also the breed complementarity aspect and that sort of thing. So, where do you see hybrid vigor fitting in fitting in the system for for, for what you're trying to achieve? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think one of the benefits of of using composite breeding, and and again, we're just looking at the terminal side, although. You know, from our breeding program standpoint, but obviously we get benefits by then crossing that that terminal composite onto a 
a third breed. Um, but you know, ultimately, one of the, you know the main benefits we see from from composite breeding, you know, there are going to be some heterosis benefits. Uh, but you know, on the terminal side, I, I I tend to think that the heterosis is probably a little less important. And really, what's important is that that breed complementary that you mentioned. It's about putting the right pieces together to give you to give you the, the outcome that you're looking for. And so, really, that's where we see a huge advantage in that composite breeding is build a Again, being able to put that right genetic package together, being able to take the best things, the best pieces from different breeds and put them in the package that serves our customers. Yeah. And so a composite breed um, versus a structured crossbreeding program. So over the years, people have uh, looked at sort of doing structured crossbreeding programs, fancy three-way crosses, a bit like, you know, chickens and, and, and with your background on pigs, you'd understand very, very well better than me the the benefits that can come from structured crossbreeding programs, but but in cattle, um, why are we going the composite composite route? Yeah, I think I think there's uh, yeah, as you mentioned, I think there's just a lot of challenges around around um, you know a, 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 you know whether it be a rotational crossbreeding, whatever type of you know structured crossbreeding system you're talking about, and certainly there are some you know some heterosis benefits to doing that. But I think ultimately, again, uh, particularly when you're looking at the terminal side of things, I think you don't lose a lot uh, by putting that composite together, but what you gain in simplicity. You know, far outweighs what you might lose in terms of, of retained heterosis or, or those sorts of things. Sure, sure. So where does that lead breeds? What, where's, what's the future for breeds? Yeah, no, I think you know, I think the the, the breed societies and breed associations have have made tremendous progress over the, over the last you know hundred years or or, or more. Um, you know, I think they continue to, to continue to make progress in terms of you know adding genomics to the evaluations and those sorts of things. And so I think you know, I think I think you know, the, the breed, the, the, you know, the, the individual breed idea, I think that's, that, that's very strong, but I think there's, there is a whole market that that's open to, to something like, you know, composite, composite breed. I think, again, there are these underserved markets that what they're looking for, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of reasons people, you know, um, have, have breeding programs within a specific breed, but, but the, I think there's a lot of underserved markets where they're, they're really just looking for the best genetic package. I'm not saying we couldn't get some of that from, from, from individual breeds, but ultimately what we're looking at is how do, how do we just serve that market in the best way that we can? Yeah, sure. And so before you talked about hybrid vigor and you sort of said from a, for a terminal point of view, it's probably not the main emphasis, and 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 I agree with you. Um, but that leaves the question: you know, hybrid vigor is is a powerful thing on the maternal side at times, and um, composites or or using that hybrid vigor maternally could be really interesting. Any plans in that space? Yeah, no, I think I agree. I think it could be interesting, and you know, you uh, you made reference to to pig breeding or chicken breeding programs, and I think again from a from a pig breeding program standpoint, obviously, you know, they, they see a lot of value in 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 doing those those crosses on, on the on the female side on on the dam side of things, and so I think certainly there are, there are opportunities out there, and I think again, I think cross breeding is probably. The, the most, un, well, I don't know how to say the most, but certainly crossbreeding is an underutilized approach, uh, you know, to make to make a better cow herd. You know, from our point of view, uh, you know, the, the terminal side is something that that we, we see a lot of opportunity in today. And I think it's probably a little more straightforward than than addressing the maternal side of things. And so we feel you know, we feel like, you know, we, we have a strong lineup of, of genetics that are going to deliver what our customers need on the, on the maternal side. And so really today our focus is on creating the right terminal genetics. Sure, sure. And uh, this may be a question that you may or may not be able to answer, but I guess in New Zealand, uh, you know, some of your programs are, are very interesting. Uh, we've got quite a different production system here, as, as you know. We, we are almost exclusively grass-fed. We've only got one feedlot in the whole country, and on the, the U.S. scale of things, that feedlot's niche anyway. Um, well, that's important for, for some of our, our programs, but... Um, so we're mainly grass-fed, as is sort of half of Australia, I suppose. Uh, do you think that the sort of terminal genetics that you're producing um, for a more grain-oriented system are likely to work well in a grass-fed system? Yeah, I, you know, I think that's a great question. And what I would say is that, 
you know, we are obviously focused on a grain uh, on a grain finishing system here in the U.S. Um, in Brazil, we, we have a bit of a hybrid. Um, you know, we do have some uh, confinement finishing operations in Brazil. I think the last number I saw is somewhere between 10 and 12 percent of cattle in Brazil are finished in some sort of confined operation. Uh, and even those that aren't, you know, there, there's there's probably a little bit of grain there uh, anyway. But it, but again, it's, it's a bit more of a hybrid in terms of we're dealing with cattle that, that may or may not be finished in that sort of that sort of system. And then in the UK, we're dealing, we're dealing with cattle that aren't finished in a grain system that are finished, you know, uh, on a, in, in, a, in a forage based system. And so so what I'd say is, while, you know, we haven't specifically done the research to look at you know, really the correlation and performance or, or a comparison of the performance between a grain fed system and a grass fed system. What I can say is the genetics that we put in these various systems are, are really performing very well. And so we have a project going on in the UK, for example, where one of the bulls that we've created is actually the best performing bull uh, in that system. And that would be on a forage based system. And so it really, to me, it provides, kind of hammers home or you know provides the emphasis emphasis that we can create genetics that maybe are, are really good on the grain finishing system but also have a lot of value for that grass system as well sure so matt uh just really interested in in where you see beef production going on on a worldwide scale what what are, what are the big challenges but what are the what's the next opportunity for for beef production and beef genetics yeah, I, I, think, I think certainly there are a lot of challenges. You know, there are a lot of competing protein sources uh, that people have access to around the world. I think, you know, we are certainly seeing a lot of growth uh, in the consumption of beef, in, specifically in certain markets. Uh, but ultimately, you know, there's challenges from the, you know, from the consumer side of things. There are challenges from the, um, uh, you know, from regulatory, from discussions about sustainability and, and, and you know, the impact of beef on, on global climate and, and those sorts of things. So I, I think we have a lot of challenges, but I definitely also think we have a lot of opportunities. I uh, think there's a lot of opportunities to show uh, that beef production can be efficient and can be sustainable. And I think the work we have to do is really collect the data and make the genetic improvement towards those sorts of goals and i think there's there's a lot of opportunities uh that that we just haven't addressed yet in terms of, of collecting that right data and i think you know as the technology has gotten better and continues to get better i think that'll provide us opportunities to collect to collect phenotypes to collect data that we never thought we could uh, and so i really you know from our point of view i think that's really where we're looking to go is you know how do we make genetic improvement and we can make genetic improvement for those traits that that are commonly collected today um, and even feed, feed intake is becoming something that's that's more and more common. But really, how do we look towards the future, and how do we find those traits uh, and those phenotypes that that are going to impact where where the industry is going? And how do we how do we how do we set ourselves up as an industry to to make improvement towards towards those sorts of traits? Yeah. So genetics has got a big role to play in the future of beef. Then we're. I have, absolutely. I think. I think, um, you know, just traditionally genetics is, is maybe not valued as it should be across the supply chain. Yeah. Um, and I think I think we have the opportunity to use genetics to address some of that. But, you know, going forward on a larger scale, we have the opportunity to use genetics to address the challenges that we're going to continually, that we're going to increasingly face, you know, around the world in terms of, uh, of how we produce beef. Well, that's probably a, a great place to leave it, Matt. Um, we... Look forward to, to seeing what comes out of this this um, composite system, and uh, we may see some of it in New Zealand at some point. Um, we, we're, we're welcome. We're, we're very open to having a look at different things over here. We we want to look at uh, what's what's going to take our our beef industry forward, just like just like you looking at other beef industries around the world and, and taking them forward. So thanks very much for your for your time in doing this. Great. Oh, uh, thank you, Jason. I appreciate the time to to, to, to talk, talk about some of the things we're doing. So good evening, it's Jason Archer here from uh, from Abacus Bio, and and I'm with Bill Cornell from from ABS Global in, in Australia. Um, Bill, we've just uh, seen um, a, a clip from Matt Cleveland uh, in the same company, ABS Global, but based in the USA. So, um, Bill, just give us you know the thirty second intro. Who are you? What's your role with ABS? Where are you located? Uh, what's your background? Yeah, thanks, Jason. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm based in Australia. I'm the beef product manager and sales manager for ABS Australia, and also my territory covers New Zealand. I've been with ABS for about 
15 years now, uh, having previously been with other AI companies. Uh, my role, a personal role, is out there to get um, Australasian genetics out through the world and also to supply to um, Australasia uh, genetics from, um, from outside the world coming back into the country to try and breed better cattle. So uh, that's my role. So the composite game, really interesting topic. Um, what's your thought? Where, where do you see um, composite breeding, cross breeding, and and all that sort of thing fitting into temperate beef production? Certainly, thanks, Jason. And, and sure, we did hear a lot about how we can use these composite bulls um, in the dairy industry, and Matt's covered that fairly well. And then, of course, the classic is uh, in terms of tropical and Australia's got a lot of tropical area, uh, we've sort of seen the Brahman boss industry as cattle. Now, I'm well aware in New Zealand it's really a, a British and European breeds. So we have a look at those breeds, and in the early days when the influx of limousines and charolais and um, simmentals came in, in the 70s, of course, those bulls were... Uh, used over the cows and we produced the F1s, F2s and upgraded. So some of those early bulls were also crossbred bulls on the way through to try and um, uh, improve the uh, improve the numbers in the breed. Sure. Um, today we have a look and um, uh, New Zealand grass-fed environment, um, you know, Angus, uh, Pole Hereford or Hereford uh, seem to be the kings out there with um, a certain amount of European flavour, a little bit of Charolais, a little bit of Simmental. But we do, st we also do see that there are composite bulls out there uh, that are coming through, as in uh, the Risington program, for example. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're doing composite bulls so, and crossbred bulls, so it's not something that's totally foreign to everybody. Sure. Um, if you wish me to expand a little bit further on that, what the real role of these animals are, of course, is hybrid vigor yep. and um, that, that and the heterosis and and what we found over here in Australia for example was when uh, the Angus juggernaut really got rolling and we had a lot of uh, British and Euro breeders moving to having more Angus involved the first time that they'd use the bulls they get a tremendous F1 kick and then they go out and buy another bull get an F2 get an F3 and if you ask the question around the place at the moment um, uh, for these people have been upgrading, they're probably paying more for their bulls with high EBVs, but yet the cows, the, the progeny coming through are pressing the scales down as, as much as what they used to. And of course what's happened is that they've uh, bred the hybrid vigour out of them to, to take them to be more purebred. Um, so we just have a look at it, is that hybrid, come, hybrid vigour comes in two forms, terminal and maternal. and um, it's just really, as I say, a, a free lunch. And um, we certainly need purebreds, but in a commercial sense of the world, it's just sitting there um, to get more income, to get more growth, to get more performance. Um, you know, the use of crossbred hybrid bulls is, uh, you know, it's a logical choice. I mean, we've seen it in all other species, so why not beef? Where does the composite fit in versus the F1 bull versus... Um, doing a, a really structured crossbreeding program, so you know, for example, an, an F1 type female with a with a third terminal star across them. How do you see all that? Okay, that can be done in a, a few different matters. One is the farmer can um, take on the whole project himself, and as you alluded to, that um, you know they have to have significant numbers and uh, be very well structured with the with the breed. What, what we have here in Australia, and I'm sure in, in uh, New Zealand it's the same way, if we refer to the sheep programs, we do have dedicated breeders that actual fat breed the F1 uh, females, and then the farmer buys in his F1 replacements, buys in the, uh, the size, and then uh, breeds a total terminal uh, animal uh, to send into the marketplace. Certainly there'd be scope to, to do that in New Zealand if over a period of time, people dedicate themselves to breeding, you know, F1 animals, farmers then just do everything terminal and then they just go back to the, um, go back to their replacement provider uh, for the F1 females to go through. 
Uh, so that's one way to do it. The other way, to, of course, to do it is to be very simple for the small herds is to do a crisscross program um, using, and this will probably suit the purebred breeders a little bit better, um, where they've maybe got Angus and Hereford, uh, they marry the two together, get their F1 uh, animal, and then if the animal's got lots of white on it, they might decide to mate it to the Angus. If it's just about black, they mate it to the Herefords, and they just complementarity, they just keep uh, putting in Angus or Hereford and the way they go. And in the in a program like that, you could have 80 cows only and um, one Angus bull and one Hereford bull and just and crisscross them back. Um, but of course, and that doesn't quite uh, solve the problem of, about what the question was about, is there a role for crossbred bulls? And what we have here in Australia is we do have some people that have uh, bred across them and got their Hereford Angus female, who's one of the greatest cows in the in the business, and then had their black baldy or their Angus Hereford bull, and then gone into a production of almost again stabilising a Angus Hereford cross and gaining the heterosis all the time. Sure. And then if they start to lose a little bit, they can tip a bit more Angus or tip a bit more Hereford into it to spice it up and keep rolling from there. Yeah, yeah. So one of the other complications from a practical point of view is. Um, we generally like to have specialised bulls to mate heifers as well. So you, you break it down for that small herd and um, and then you've got to have heifer mating bulls. You've got to have the bull to take it one way, the bull to take it the other way, um, you know, the, the different breed bulls. And, and you end up with more bulls than cows just about if, if you're not careful. So uh, so where does the composite um, concept, which is, you know, I'd just buy the composite bull, what, where, where does ABS going with that concept? Good, and thank you for that question, uh, Jason. What I see is with uh, in beef breeding, of course, we know how vital fertility is to the program. Yep. I'd, I'd suggest if you, you wouldn't have heifer bulls, um, what you would do is you'd keep your heifer crop and then you'd do a fixed time AI program where you'd anticipate to get 50 to 60% of the heifers get pregnant. Um, keep all the heifers that get pregnant to the AI so you can select on a proven carving ease bull for them yep. uh, and keep all the heifers that get pregnant to the AI and then the rest of them go. Yep. And then you start to say, man, but what a Dorothy, that really good little one that I loved and she didn't get in calf on the first round of AI, it's just too bad. We're keeping the 50 or 60% that are in calf. Now the other deluxe thing for the farmer is then, of course, is those heifers are then going to carve in about an 11 to 14 day window. So you get one mob intensive on the ground and then those heifers of course can be managed through the farm. They can go through and clip all the pastures in front of the cows. They can get the added benefit of, of being born maybe a couple of weeks before the cows. And the heifers are going to have plenty of time to get back into calf to join the cow herd. Sure. Any of the resultant heifer calves or bull calves they wish to use are born early, so next time round they're right. So it, again, that's really the power of, of uh, I see of fixed time AI um, and genetics really combining to make fantastic not only cap uh, not only genetic gains but tremendous gains for the uh, for cattle management. So yeah, and and the other thing to add, sorry to waffle on a bit, but of course those calves that are born by AI are going to be born you know, three to six weeks before the backup bull would have got them in calf on the second or third time around. So you've got 21, 42 days, a kilo a day. You know, by keeping those heifers that don't get to the AI, it's already cost you 30, 60 bucks in production just straight away by, by holding them back, let alone the problem is that those heifers will probably fall out of the system in a year or two. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. So no. that's how I'd see that problem being handled. So, so Bill... I used to work in Australia, as you know, in the 1990s, uh, in, in the cattle game too. And uh, while I, you know, in the 1990s in Southern Australia, um, the town got painted black, basically. And and the reason was the uh, the Japanese market had opened up and we were chasing marbling and, and Angus was the breed that uh, wasn't the only breed that could do it, but it was probably the breed that capitalised on it the most. And so the argument that people used to, to give to me was... Um, Yes, I can. I, I could get some hybrid vigor in my cow, but in doing so, I'm forgoing a little bit of the premium that I might get for having a, a, a straight Angus calf. So, 
Um, where do you see that? Has, has that changed at all? Has the balance of that changed? Um, can we have hybrid vigor in the cow from a, from a composite type program or an F1 type program and still get our carcass? Uh, <clears throat> yes, I believe that. I, I believe we can. Um, you're right. So what's happened in the 1990s is still, is still prevalent today. It's a great marketing tool. Um, <clears throat> the um, feed lotters like to say they don't want any white on the on the Angus cattle. Otherwise, they tend to give you a discount. Uh, there's a, a lot of breeders out here or commercial producers are saying we don't get actual fat physically paid for marbling, but we get paid for weight. So. Uh, and the Wagyu storm that's happening at the moment, people are saying, well, we're getting a, a big price for, uh, for the Wagyus, but we're in terms of cents per kilo, but they don't weigh as much. So now we refer back to your question. Um, the thing that I've found is personally is that we breed um, Sim Angus using the black Simmental over our Angus females. Mm -hmm. uh, those animals, the F1s, uh, quite happily run through the, uh, the market uh, the, the sold as Angus, even though I have them as black Simmentals, they um, just have a little bit more punch to them, uh, got a little extra top to them. Usually they top the market, um, and I get a bit infuriated sometimes because they come back as designated Angus. It says in this, you know, we get a top price on their Angus, so, so they're black Simmentals. But in the in the end, that's come back and helped me because. When I'm marketing uh, black Simmental bulls and Sim Angus bulls to people, uh, they say we don't want to lose this Angus advantage. Well, they don't lose the Angus advantage because these cattle of a complementarity of their colour uh, are being sent through as Angus. And, and um, you know, I'm sure a lot of brands and so forth won't want to hear that, but that that's just physically what's happening here. So I think you can gain. Uh, the hybrid vigour, as long as the complementarity and the look of the breed uh, is still pretty much maintained. You can put other breeds in there to make it happen. Sure, yeah. So, as you know, you've spent a fair bit of time in New Zealand. Um, our cattle have to have to work pretty hard over winter and they've got to walk up and down a hill or two um, to, to get a bite to eat. Um, and so... I think rightly or wrongly, um, we're quite focused on keeping our cow size um, down. Um, so just interested in hearing your thoughts about, well, should we be keeping our cow size down? And, and if so, um, you know, the, the Sim Angus or whatever other breed mix we put in, um, where, where does that fit in with, with cow size? Yeah, sure. Um, look, let's, if, you, if we take the Sim Angus uh, thing, if we... Uh, um, Magnificent thing we do have with the American Simmental Association is really the, the the performance cattle breed association, as you're probably aware of, Jason. And they uh, performance record lots of breeds all on the big on all their massive database, um, and also hybrid bulls, you know, Sim Angus, Simmental, etc. Even Angus are on there. Um, so consequently, from the uh, performance recording, we can find bulls that have got the growth and then they back off. You know, ideally, people here in Australia say we'd like to have the mature cow weight uh, the same or a little less than the 400 day weight if they can really get it. So you get that rapid growth and get the more moderate uh, cow size. So that's available sure. in, um, in, the, in, in, in the composite breeds as well. Um, the debate on what is the ideal size cow. Um, yeah, that, that's that's really another hornet's nest. Um, it is, and I suppose it's going to depend on your environment and and what really works uh, work works for you. And of course, we've got net feed efficiency figures, and we've got feed conversion, and um, which are two uh, different different models. And uh, yeah, I'm not quite so sure where it should be. I think I think people in general sort of feel an animal that's that frame five, frame six type cow that's sort of, um, you, you know, around about 550, 600 kilos is about where she needs to be. Um, uh, yeah, that, sure. that's what they say. I don't know um, if there's any, eventually if there's been really hard research uh, in New Zealand to say, you know, what what's this cow going to do? 
the, the other thing too is to uh, uh, bring up a couple of things is with the uh, the crossbred cow, uh, research has shown that well the Simmental Association say that that she's 30, 25 to thirty percent uh, more lifetime production than a purebred cow. Um, you know your hybrid cow is a more fertile, and the research has been uh, through there, like Patsy Horton at, at um, Heartland uh, Heifer Development says that she gets about eight percent more conception rate out of a uh, crossbred cow, uh, and also the crossbred cow uh, sort of the fact that she's not pure, you'll tend to find that things that come along with heterosis are they need less uh, doctoring, so to speak. They seem to be more resilient. Um, to any disease effects, um, any things in terms of structure, which I know Australia and New Zealanders are very conscious of. And if you walk in the hills and in terms of their structure, their feet, etc., you know, hybrid vigors fixes up a lot of those things. So, in in essence, overall, the only debate about whether the hybrid cows any um, if, if she gets too big or not, uh, that's about the only thing that we can really do because in in all other assets. Uh, fertility and maintenance and um, and just survivability. Uh, she's probably a better model, actually. Yeah. Okay. So um, I'm I'm sure the uh, the the Angus and and, and Hereford bull breeders listening to this will be uh, will be itching at their itching their seats and tapping away on their keyboards right now. Um, and, and we'll have some questions in a, in a minute. But uh, you mentioned the American Simmental Association and the evaluation they run, and and um, I know they've just uh, implemented some single step evaluation um, using genomics and using uh, Dorian Garrick's Bolt software. Um, so genomics, where does that fit in the world of uh, crossbred or composite bulls? I, I think it fits in straight in the same uh, pathway as what uh, uh, purebreds are. I mean, uh, at the present moment uh, in the Simmental business, you, you can, um, uh, you know, genomically test um, uh, Simengus for a start and uh, go into their database. So, uh, yeah, I, I think I think as we learn more and more about genomics, I think there's a role in there for uh, for the beef breeds entirely for all beef breeds. And, um, and as you're aware, Jason, of course, in the dairy uh, breeds, we've seen just such massive um, uh, use of genomics uh, in, in the dairy industry and. And it really seems to be working. And of course, we'll have different parameters, and it's a, a lot more testing to go on. And we're only in the infancy stages, I feel, about uh, uh, beef genomics. But at the end of the day, um, you know, it's going to play a big role in everything we do. And uh, with that point, then I believe that um, uh, you know the hybrid animal is going to be to you know, be able to be genomically tested as we move down, and uh, we'll gather more information on him as we go. So. So, Bill, you know, at the moment um, in New Zealand, as you have mentioned, we've got a, we've got a couple of um, composite to an, and, and hybrid type programs, um, you know, the stabilizer with focused genetics, you mentioned Risington before, and, and one or two other people do similar things, but, but the majority uh, of our bulls sold do still fall into, um, into the purebred category, be that Hereford, be that Angus, be that Simmental, Limousin, Shirley, um, or whatever. Is there still a role for breeds? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, to, to crossbreed, you've got to have purebreds. Um, so you're going to need that. Uh, you're going to need those genetics uh, and and the diversity that it offers. And, and at the end of the day, we've talked about performance. We've talked about genomics. And let's say you take some of these traditional breeds at the moment. Uh, I uh, particularly that say Angus Herefords and so forth. They'll they'll be around forever, and, that, and they're going to be a, a linchpin of the whole program um, because for the C stock breeders that are going to use them, I mean the database that they've got is just enormous, and why would you want to throw that all away? So I can see there's going to be a role for the purebreds um, all the way through. I think what we're debating about, in one way, if we can say debate, is that we're looking at the commercial use of, of hybrid um, vigor, of, com, of crossbred bulls. I, we're going to need um, purebred uh, seed stock producers to, uh, to be producing the core genetics. And at the moment, you know, while uh, some might say that ABS is uh, 
promoting a, a different idea, we're going to opposition or or whatever. I, I see the whole thing being, uh, you know, a cooperative effort uh, to increase um, the efficiency of our of our beef organisation, and and everybody's still got a role to play. And the people, the fellows in the seed stock industry that do it the best. Uh, will get truly rewarded, and they and, and they've got nothing to fear. In actual fact, um, I think they've got more benefits ahead. Sure. So, so you're not abandoning the uh, the Hereford breeders and the Angus breeders. You're you're still still going to have a role in terms of bringing out semen from some of the best bulls, and also hopefully when we breed some really good bulls in New Zealand, distributing them elsewhere as well. That's that's still part of your business plan. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I uh, during my lifetime and well beyond, I. I can't see the, um, uh, you, you know, the purebreds uh, disappearing. I can see uh, slowly the commercial herds uh, taking in board and, and breeding, um, you, you know, with crossbred bulls. But they might find that, you know, they also need to take on board um, a purebreds. And as we discussed earlier, they might go into one of those zigzag crosses just using. Now, pure Angus and pure Hereford bulls and create their own commercial programs by just crisscrossing back and forth. So, yeah, so yeah I think they'll be around for a long, long time. Okay. So I'm just going to put myself in the shoes of a, of a purebred bull breeder or a bull breeder in New Zealand now. And um, look, as, as we all know, a bull breeder makes, you know, they get rewarded for what they do by selling bulls. Um, and, and at the end of the day, you know, AI might might, might increase in, in the commercial world and, and, you know, you've given us a good suggestion for, for a heifer program, uh, but there's still going to be a lot of bulls on the hoof required and, and, and these these breeders are going to be the main source of them. What would you say to the breeders in terms of where they should be taking their business next? Okay, look, as the industry uh, is getting um, uh, more, more technical and so forth, I think the thing that they have to do, and I always advocate at any meetings I talk to, is that uh, love it or hate it, you have to take the performance data, keep good contemporary groups, keep really good data um, together, so thus you can in in you know prove the worth of your animals uh, through the collection of the data. So I think that's really important, and identifying um, those particular whether it be cow lines, bull lines, and so forth that are going to return. Um, more money because to the uh, to farmers that use their genetics because they better fit into the marketplace. The yeah. other thing that they can do is, if you let's say you've got a, a herd, and we'll pick on Angus uh, a bit, um, you've got a bunch of Angus cows that are, are going really well, really well recorded, and the marketplace is slowly shifting, maybe to producing crossbred bulls, and um, and the farmer feels a little bit worried about what's going on. An easy solution for him to do is to AI with sex semen from another breed. Let's say so he takes on board a black simmental, so he uses sex male black semen, uh, black simmental semen, and thus he'll produce some crossbred bulls, sim Angus bulls, out of his Angus cows, which are truly recorded, got a heap of data, and the simmental bulls got a, a bunch of data as well. He doesn't have to worry about having F1 cows. He just keeps his straight um, Angus cows, but he can enter that market just with the use of um, six male semen. So there's still opportunities uh, in that regard for purebreds to, on the side, become a cross crossbred user, so uh, and supplier of bulls as well. Sure. And, and we're seeing that, and in the US too, we're seeing that happening. I mean. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, there are, there are ranches over there uh, that fellows would be well and truly think, uh, aware of uh, true iconic Angus herds over there that are also producing maybe uh, 10 to 20 per cent, um, uh, you know, hybrid bulls and then selling them alongside their Angus bulls at their sales and still getting well paid for them. So it really does uh, open up another market for the breeder as well. So we talked a lot about Sim Anguses, and that's a very popular cross in, in the US and, and I gather in Australia a little bit as well. Um, but, um, and I guess that's partly because Simmental um, comes from a sort of dual purpose background, so has a bit of maternal. Um, but in the terminal type of scenario, um, 
you know, there's there's other breeds out there. I'm just trying to make sure they feel the love too. So, you know, there's the Chirolet, your Limousin, um, and, and whatever else that's probably more more an out and out terminal in the way we use them over here anyway. Um, role for crossbreeding in the, in those sort of breeds? Oh, I think so. Um, in a practical uh, position, a lot of people here in Australia ask me, Bill, how would you breed commercial cattle? And I say to them, well, what I do is I'd start off with, and because we've um, identified at the moment that, that the black hided cattle seem to be attracting a lot more attention into feedlots over here or over, over in your thing for your premium Angus brands, is that over here we tend to, I tend to say, put a waggy bull over all your heifers to start with so that you catch a F1 um, wagyu and uh, Angus Cross and the heifers get in the calf quickly and et cetera, have an easy calf, so that's it. Um, then I've suggested to some is then for the next two or three um, cross, uh, next two or three rounds, uh, breed those cows to their Angus, which produce one or two heifers out of every cow, which become replacements. And then for about year six on, when that cow's really at her maximum production, um, as a beef cow is from five to nine years of age, you know, you grab your livers and your chalet or your simmental or whatever, put them over the top and um, just maximise your terminal ability uh, for the calves on the way through. So uh, that way you're still sort of working off your base base animal um, and that's sort of a crossbreeding uh, function, uh, not requiring any um, uh, crossbred bulls in that example, but uh, is uh, using hybrid vigour to its maximum extent. Sure, yeah. So, Bill, you mentioned a couple of times the fact that with a black hided animal you get the premium for for Angus anyway. So I've just got to ask this question. Uh, black hide um, and, and, and Angus, I guess, used to be associated with marbling and, and, and carcass quality. And and now we've got black hides everywhere, um, regardless of, of breed origin, um, almost. So is black hidedness going to continue to be the thing that we're after? Because really, I thought we were after carcass quality and and we're going to have new tools in the future, genomics. Genomics might get cheap enough to be used commercially even. Um, where, where's that going to go? Are we not better off using genomics rather than hide colour? Oh, I think so. <clears throat> I think just at the present moment, as we're finding in the industry today, to get the feedback uh, from the genomic labs at the present moment just takes time and, and expense and maybe the, 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 that's uh, not the way it is, um, and we can do it. But at a point, let's say, when a turnaround time could be seven days or something like that, and the cost might be 15 bucks to, you know, pull a hair, send it off, yep. you know, feedlot buyer coming in or a backgrounder for grass or something's coming in, has the target market, pull a tail hair, send it off, and, and um, send the animal, you know, send the genomics off, and it comes back and says, you know, cows A, B, C, or steers A, B, C, they want D and E are out, F and G they want. You can have a drafting gate just purely on genomics. And sure. and I think that's going to be the way it's going to go. And in fact, if you really get down to the hard point, um, is whenever you come into, let's say, a tough time, you can almost take the uh, the tail hairs out of the calves, you know, when they're a month of age, yep. and then you can, in fact, start thinking about the best way you're going to market those cars, which ones are going to be the premium, uh, ones that are going to hit the target market for your thing, and those that aren't quite there, you know, they might have to rough it a bit. So, sure. Um, yeah, yeah it, it, it could really lend, it could really lend itself. And um, as we just said, and I'm thinking aloud here, you know, genomic tests them when they're babies, um, you know, you, as a farmer, you'd start to go, right, well, these ones, with their genomics are potentially worth one, two, three hundred dollars more than their uh, contemporaries. So we better make sure we look after them and hit the maximum weight with them. To, um, so yeah, I, I mean this this game can really get turned on its head by genomics over a period of time. It's all just about uh, delivery by the labs and um, and the cost of doing it. Price point. Yep. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. It's it's going to trans transform uh, the way we do things um, markedly. But we've got a little bit of water to go under the bridge yet, I, th I think. So, Bill, that's been uh, that's been really in interesting uh, insights that we've had in this discussion. Um, 
and uh, we'll hang around and, and, and have some questions now, which you'll answer on behalf of ABS for both Matt and, and yourself. But uh, thanks very much for your time and doing this. And um, yeah, appreciate, appreciate your input and look forward to seeing more of you over here. Yeah, thank you very much, Jason. And I must say, it has been a challenge to um, uh, deliver this sort of idea to um, uh, to the New Zealand cattle producers, and uh, some of them will be uh, feeling a little bit, um, you know, ho hum about what we have to say. And and I can empathise with them um, dramatically because it was about 15 years ago when I decided my beautiful Angus cows and I decided I'd start crossbreeding them. I'll tell you, the first day I went there to put a straw of uh, non-Angus semen into one of the cows, I thought I was cutting my throat. But <laughs> when I saw the results, I've, I've, I've really, I've really uh, uh, appreciated what happened. But uh, sure. at the end of the day, what, we, what we're looking at as cattle producers are that the cattle are out there in grasslands. Cattle get all the, all the land that you can't crop, that you can't put your sheep on, that uh, everything. So the poor old cow is out there harvesting, let's say, wasteland yep. and then producing perhaps the best form of protein that we all love to eat. Yep. And um, the, the world's always going to want them and, uh, you know, anything that we can do out there and ABS's thing is about feeding the world and, um, uh, yeah, that, that's going to be the biggest conquest. And if... Uh, uh, whatever we can do to be able to facilitate that as, as cattle producers is uh, uh, what we're going to strive to do. So I uh, appreciate that I've had the opportunity to throw these points out and uh, we'll see what feedback we get. So thank you very much.